Yeah. How is everyone doing this fine Tuesday? It is time for Talk Tuesday. And uh, a completely new topic today and the next few. As you can probably tell by my setup here, music. Music theory, to be precise. So, this is a thing. Just a bit more so that I get a clean fit. Yep. Because I want to use this annotate as close to the keyboard as possible okay there we go all right let's hope this thing does not collapse on me i have like i literally have firefox and krita open like this on my other screen um where i have to switch between them you can see i just accidentally pressed a button but that's okay Back to okay. Right, let's see if this works. Like always, um, just waiting a little bit to uh, to get give people a bit of time to get in here, right? Because it's probably a bit more imperative that uh, people come here in the beginning. So let me turn on some music, if I can find some relaxing music. Ooh. This is, this seems fitting. The Brahms, Hannes Brahms. Good playing. All right. So, a bit of Brahms while we wait. A bit fitting for music theory, even though, you know, it's not restricted to classical music. Jazz, for instance, has a lot of music theory in as, as well. Um, really, any music. That's the whole point. <laughs> and that's something I will get to once I start. But yeah, before I dive too deep into this, just waiting a little bit, 10, 12, 15 minutes, give people some time to arrive. This is just like when you're teaching actual classes, especially morning classes. Um, you start the class on time, half the students are sitting in the room. And then over the course of the next 15-20 minutes, students just trickle in one by one. So the first 20 minutes, hey Goliath, how are you doing? Nice to see you here. I'm just talking about students trickling into class at the beginning <laughs> um, from my experiences as a teacher. And uh but yeah, new new topic, music theory. Um, we're still waiting a little bit just to let people come in if they want to. You know, it, as a teacher and a student myself, I I understand that it sucks if you miss the beginning of. This is not a class, but you know, similar enough. Um. So I just want to give people a chance to get in here and uh, get comfy before I actually start with the topic. And every day I stream I realize I desperately need a microphone arm and my microphone is on a stand right now standing on my desk 
in front of my keyboard and next to my tablet so it's just messing everything up right now um i i really need a microphone arm <laughs> but you know investment and money and eh, i'll make do with what i have right now so as long as it doesn't completely break down i'm okay with it now maybe wait another five minutes or so <clears throat> for people to come in and uh give me a bit of a chance to warm up my voice as well <laughs> So yeah, just filling space and time. I had some weird dreams again, and I constantly have weird dreams. I was dreaming that I was asleep and streaming at the same time or something, and chat was going nuts. It's it's very strange. So that happened. And a bunch of other really messed up stuff like being invited to a wedding. I don't know whose wedding, just that I had to dress up and I didn't want to because I didn't know the person. Like, yeah. <laughs> Almost like fever dreams, I guess. Oh, oh. <laughs> well, I guess mine wasn't really a nightmare, but dang, yeah, nightmares suck. Especially the ones that jolt you awake. D E F G E C D. Oh, wait, that's. Wait. D E F G E C D. Like that? Oh no, it. <laughs> Do. Oh my god. Okay, you got me. You got me. <laughs> uh... Okay, that was a good one. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, this this is called The Lick. Um, used very, very often in music during improvisation and such. Like that. Right, with, a, with a slightly more correct tempo. I'm clicking on this with my mouse, which is why I can't really play it as accurately. But with the right tempo, you can probably see where it is. <laughs> but dang. <laughs> but now I know that the lake is in Dorian. That's that's interesting to know. <laughs> um, I do know that one or two p other people wanted to join in with this, so I do want to. I don't know. One more minute, maybe. Also gives me a chance to eat a little bit because I'm smart and didn't eat before the stream. So I have a big bowl of pasta in front of me right now. Professional streamer. Mm. But yeah, I will be turning off the music. Um. Or at least turning it very low. Um, once I start, just because you know I <laughs> the background music, I will be turning that low because 
I will be playing some things on this piano app website thing um, as as demonstration, right? Things like chords. Oops. If I don't misclick, or maybe it'll, it's easier with the tablet. Yeah. Right. So I will I will be using this. Um. So I don't want the background music to um, interfere too much with that. Let me turn down the music a little bit. Um, where that should be. Okay, it's very quiet in the back. Right. So I would say, um, I'll start with a bit of introduction. To this topic and um, because music theory is something either unknown or overlooked or even reviled because people don't understand what it actually is so let me scroll correctly okay this is the edge all right start at the top corner all right so music Theory. What is it? Why is it? Do I need it? What do I do with it? Right. So, I think a lot of people misunderstand music theory and they think music theory tells me that music has to be like this. Right. A lot of people, even musicians and people who work with music, uh, talk about music theory this way. Um, saying like, oh, I, I hate it learning music theory because now it means all the music I do has to be like this. Right? I have to do it. I have to follow these rules. I have to do it like this. And that's not true. That's backwards. Music theory is much more a science, and as a science, what music theory does is describe and, if possible, explain. Right? So, music theory looks at music that, as it exists, as it is being made and performed, and tries to see how it works, tries to demystify it and look at the inner workings, right? And it tries to name things and tries to find patterns and tries to find similarities so that you can better talk about music, right? So that you can say, oh, this song does this. Why does this part of the song sound so good? Good, or why does this not fit in the song? Or why do these two songs sound similar? Or, you know, what what is this music direction as opposed to that music direction? Um, a lot of these things are described and to some extent explained by music theory. Um, yes, exactly. That's the next step, right? Music theory is not a straight jacket, just like how a lot of other sciences... <laughs> yes, music theory jail, I like that. Um, a lot of, like, okay, the natural sciences, you can't really break the rules because that's just how reality works. But a lot of the, uh, like, especially artistic things, right? Color theory for painting um, is one big example that comes to mind. Um, composition for photography 
and so on. Um, a, a lot of those kind of sciences that try to describe how things were made up to now, you can then look at it and go, okay, what if I try this particular thing differently? What if I try to match these two colors instead of the two colors people have matched all this time? Right? What happens if I try this kind of chord instead of this other thing that people have been doing all this time? Right? So it does help. It is a safety net. It's not a straitjacket. It's a safety net that you can use. Uh, to help you out when you are lost, right? when you don't know how to proceed, then you can say, well, let's look at how other people have done it. Let's look at what works. Or you can say, let's look at common patterns and let's try to do something different. Right? Um, that being said, do you need music theory to be a, a musician or a songwriter or anything like that? Oops. Not necessarily, no, but it can certainly help. But a lot of people <clears throat> talk about some of the big names that have changed various art, uh, art scenes forever, right? Picasso, for instance, Pablo Picasso. Right? Pablo Picasso is one of the most influential artists ever because he completely changed painting. But Pablo Picasso understood his field really, really, really well, right? He was already a master painter before he tried his new styles. And he already knew about color theory and composition and all of those things. And he intentionally tried to break them. He, he forced himself to relearn art essentially right so even so there's two arguments here the first one is not everyone is a pablo picasso and the second one is even pablo picasso understood theory and tried to intentionally break it right so yes music theory can definitely help you in making music how deep you go in it depends on your interest, right? Uh, what parts of it you learn depends on your interest. But overall, music theory can help. If nothing else, then putting names to things, right? Names of notes um, and uh, chords and progressions and such. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Um, I don't have any right now uh off the top of my head but yeah he i i do know like that he literally looked at how do children draw and tried to emulate that and break everything like unlearn everything he has ever learned about painting and uh try to draw like a child literally like a child to relearn art and that's where you get it Took me four years to paint like Raphael, but a lifetime to paint like a child. Yes, 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 exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that's art history. That's a different topic. It's just an illustration of how theory um, can help and has helped a lot of very famous uh, and successful artists out there. Right? There might be one or two where you can say for certain, okay, these people didn't learn theory, they just did what they did and they revolutionized their field. Um, but... <laughs> now, our, our, this is art history in the sense of going into the history of artistic endeavors, not music theory. This is like... Don't twist my words. <laughs> Art history is a different field from learning about music theory. Music is art, yes. <laughs> and there are people like Beethoven and such who did revolutionize their field as well. Um. 
Mozart? <laughs> Mozart was born a genius. Alright? Mozart cheated. <laughs> so he's he's like the one in ten billion or something. Anyway, before we drift completely onto a separate topic, music theory. Music theory. So what does music theory give you, so to speak, when you look at it? <laughs> yes. Um, music theory gives you names, right? And being able to name something accurately, name and, and uh, refer to something is really helpful, right? You no longer have to say, well, it's, it's these bunch of tones that go da 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 or something like that. No, you can actually name this is a major triad done. Right? Um, so it gives you names. It gives you patterns. Right? Things like um, keys and, and um, I'm blanking. Score. No, not scores. Um, scales. Oh my goodness. Just, I suddenly blanked on that word. Scales and keys, for instance. It gives you things like what do different tempos do? Like, how do they work? Right? Rhythms. Um, and uh, chord names, for instance. How do chords work? Um, and then it gives you... How do I name this? It, it gives you... Um, like, when you can say, Alright, this song sounds happy. Or this song sounds sad. Right? It gives you associations and effects. So, art, music, like any other art form, is emotional. In the sense that it should speak to our emotions, right? People, when people create it, ideally they create it with some sort of emotion in mind. And when people listen to it, it's a supposed to evoke some sort of emotional response, right? And emotion is something you can't really describe <laughs> scientifically-ish, right? It's, it's very subjective and it's very wishy-washy, but there are certain associations, certain connections you can draw, right? There are things like saying, oh, this chord sounds happy. This chord sounds uplifting. This sounds mysterious. Right? This sounds very dark. And so on. And and then you can say, all right, how does this music or this chord or whatever, how does this look? I know the emotional effect. How does it actually look? How does it connect to other music that might evoke a similar reaction? Right? And then you can start to piece things together. So... That's also something that it gives you, right? Describing emotion scientifically in this sense is relatively futile, but you can look at cause and effect, at least to some degree. And that's what music theory also gives you, right? So these things are tools you get when you learn about music theory, right? Names, patterns, and associations with emotional effects, mainly, mainly, right? And these can be very useful, right? This is essentially going deeper and deeper into music theory. In the beginning, you just learn a couple of names. Oh, look at... If you look at the, the piano uh, on the bottom, right, you can see C, D, e, F, G, A, B, C, D, and so on. Right? These are names of notes. So, oh, okay, now you can name a note. And now you can say, play this note. Or play a chord with these three notes. Right? Uh, and you can give it names. That's the beginning. And then you can see patterns. Oh, what is a scale? The major scale. Right? Things like that. The minor scale. And so on. And you can give those things names and then use them, right? So that also becomes a tool. 
Um, music theory. Oh, hi, Joe. <laughs> music theory has taught me that all the greatest artists just bang their head on their instrument until something interesting happens. <laughs> Kinda, but that's because they're innovating, <laughs> right? They they are innovating. The greatest artists. That's what makes them great, right? And um, sometimes you just try all sorts of weird things until something sounds nice. And then you've innovated. That's like... Um, oh, damn, what's that one artist called? <laughs> Well, I hope to change that then. Right? I hope to change that. Um, uh, but this one one artist who did, did abstract art there was even a movie about him with, with Ed Harris in the lead role. Um, I forgot the name. Uh, I'm completely blanking right now. But he basically, all he did was just take a huge canvas and just splash paint on it randomly. And he revolutionized art, <laughs> right? So that, he is one example of um, an artist who didn't study theory right? and still made something great. Um, but like I said, exception to the rule. Um, stay in key? Mm. Yeah, that's, that's also something, um, right? How, because music is theoretically endless the space of music is endless anything can be music you can just like boom that's music right does it sound great mm, debatable right <laughs> so out of this exactly music is endless and art is endless um, out of this infinite space of possible music, how do you make something that actually sounds good? Yes, music theory does have a lot of math in it. Um, so that's also something that uh, goes in there, especially once you go into chords and uh, rhythms and such, you get a lot of math. Yes, but don't be afraid. It's relatively simple math. Um, where was I? Yes, so out of this completely infinite space of music, of possible music, how do you make something that sounds nice? And I'm using the word nice in a, in a super broad sense, right? And yes, this infinite space is increased even more with technology, right? A lot of the stuff you can now do electronically, things like Black MIDI um, that you may have seen but not known the name. It's when you go on, on YouTube and you see um, uh, piano programs play music, but the music is like several hundred notes and what at once and so on. Right, that's black meaty because the entire screen would just be filled up with notes. Um, that is physically impossible for humans to play. But with computers, we can make music like that and make it sound good. Right? <laughs> is that the genre you make? <laughs> black meaty? Um... Oh yeah, so so it um yes, Rush E. Rush E is a very famous example. <laughs> Hi Kimi, how are you doing? Um And yeah, so how do you pick something that sounds nice in the broadest sense of the word, in the most subjective sense of the word? Right? Um and that is where music theory comes in, because music theory tells you, well, humans tend to prefer music that sounds like this and not music that sounds like that. Or random sounds <laughs> that sound like this or that are combined in this way. That doesn't mean that you cannot make music that sounds nice using 
these quote unquote forbidden areas of music, but you just have to know what you're doing or you have to get lucky and stumble upon something, right? Um, in this vast infinite space. So yes, music theory, like I said, music theory uh, is a safety net, not a straight jacket. Oops. Uh. Right. <laughs> Try tongues. Dubstep. <laughs> well, but even dubstep, like a lot of people like it, right? So something went right. Um, humans like it when music is similar to it, but making it exactly like it is. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Pushing the boundaries. Um, and that's that's also why you get so many pop songs that sound so similar because a lot of them are very formulaic, right? A lot of them are. Uh, you may have heard of the four chords song before. Um, there's a really there's um uh, an Australian band called Axes of Awesome that uh. <laughs> that made a song called Four Chords Song, where they just basically play the same four chords over and over and over again, and then they just mention, like, I don't know, 20 or 30 different songs, uh, popular songs, that use exactly that structure. Right, so a lot of it is very formula. Um, and... Uh, but you can also push the boundaries, and that's also where music theory comes in to show you, okay, this is where the boundary is right now. This is where music has come to right now. And uh, you can maybe push it a bit further. That's also where you get um, famous musicians uh, famous musicians in our time. Jacob Collier is a, is a big example. Like that dude, oh my god, that, he's, he's a prodigy, a true prodigy. Um, and he is experimenting a lot with microtonal music and negative harmony, right? Which is things that have not been used in Western ma uh, Western music a lot. Um, but he is experimenting with that because it hasn't been used. But he has the understanding of theory and of, of music to be able to push the boundary in in a way that can create good music. Oh, hi, Jelly. Nice to see you here. <laughs> yes. Um, if, you, if you do want to see some, some crazy, like what is currently being done in music, uh, pushing the boundaries of music, I highly suggest Jacob Collier. He will, like if you are a musician of any kind, you will become so envious of him because he's like in his mid-20s and he is... Holy crap, his, his understanding of music is... Um, but he does some amazing stuff with music theory. Uh, mm, nice, yeah, progression of the arts. Yeah, exactly. Um, how, how people pushed the boundaries and changed arts. Um, yeah, that that's... And that's exactly what... What this is, right? Music theory is not telling you music must look like this. It's telling you right now music looks like this. And what you do with it is your choice, right? You can try to push the boundaries. You can try to find something that hasn't been done before. You can play it safe, write a four chord pop song and just make a couple million dollars or something. Or you can sell your soul and make corporate music, which is... 110% formula, right? Um, but all of that is music theory as a tool, right? You use music theory in some way or another. So this is, this is something I, I want people to understand. Music theory is not telling you how music must look. It's telling you how music looks right now. Right? And the next step is up to anyone who makes music. Right. So, why music theory? 
Hopefully now this has become a bit clearer. Right? Why? Um, with that being said, let's uh, move this down so I have a bit more space and let's actually go into a bit of music. So I wanted to start out with a couple of basic concepts. Um, of course, there's the notes, as I've talked about. There's also scales and keys, which are related, but not exactly the same thing. And if we have time, if we do have time, I want to go into the circle of fifths, which is, oops, in my opinion, one of the most basic, but one of the most powerful tools in Western music um, that there is. Um, because a lot of other things can just be reduced back down to the circle of fifths. And it's it's really amazing. Just a quick question, who here knows of the circle of fifths? Just, just so I know <laughs> what I'm dealing with. Just very quick, just type yes or something if you if you've if you know about the circle of fifths already. Um But <clears throat> But yeah, so first things first, notes. Notes are relatively simple, right? You have down here a piano or a piano keyboard, piano keys, and you have Is it not pressing? It's not pressing. It's just pressing to There we go. That's that's an octave, right? That's notes. The notes, there we go. And they are labeled from A to uh, G, right? We typically start with a C. C is the most basic note that has historical reasons from uh, Gregorian chanting and, and uh, church music and so on. It's a different topic. Um, but yeah, the labels go from A all the way to G, right? And a point on names, you may have seen this already, but every note and many scales and keys and chords and such can have multiple different names, right? Right now you can see on all these white keys, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, and so on. Yeah, it is pretty much the easiest key to remember because it's just the C major key, right? Because it's just the, the the white keys on a keyboard right there um but all of these can have different names right so let me see if i can get this right align it it's not quite as aligned on my screen as it is on obs but let's see um so you get the black keys in between right also have names and these are half steps, so every single key is half a step, right? So if you go from C, this is a half step, half step, half step, half step, half step, and so on. And that's 12 notes. And these 12 notes are the chromatic scale. So this is every single note in a western octave, in a western scale. Sometimes people include this, but that would be the 13th note. Um, so a chromatic scale is all 12 of these. So there are 12 different tones in an octave, and then it just repeats, right? So this is another pattern that like we've talked about. Um, and you label, you probably know this, you label the black notes as sharps or flats right um okay this is a bit difficult to is it possible to make this octaves oh i can switch how many octaves there are 
but it doesn't go wider. At that, that sucks. Okay. I was hoping to make the keys a bit wider. Or did, did it? Let me just check again. Slightly wider. Okay, I'll take it. Alright, so. Um, so, half steps are denoted by sharp or flat. So, sharp is half a step up, flat is half a step down, and so on. Um, but then you also get things like, there is no black key between E and F. So, an F could also be an E sharp, right? And an E could also be an F flat, and so on and so forth. And you can go further and further, right? An F sharp could be a G flat. It could also be an E augmented, right? Um, that's just, they're all referring to the exact same thing. Um, it could also be a um, a double flat <laughs> and so on, an A double flat, all the same thing. This is just to show that the names are, like, they, they depend much more on context than anything else, right? They depend on scales and keys in the wider context of the music than just what is in front of you, right? Just the keys on a keyboard or strings on a guitar and so on. Right. So there are multiple names for these things, and that's okay. Right? There's no need to remember all of these names. And uh, these names really come from uh th they have a logic behind them. Right? Like I said, sharp is one half step up. So anytime you have something that's a half step up, you can call it something sharp or half a step down for flat and so on. That works. Um, so these are notes that exist, right? Then what you get is scales. Now, scales are just a collection of notes. I was talking about the chromatic scale. Come on, let me press, please. All right, that's the chromatic scale. And so you could write down, okay, we have chromatic scale. And it's just a collection of notes, right? So the chromatic scale is C, C sharp, B, B sharp, E, F, F sharp, D, G sharp, A, A sharp, B, right? Um, so a, a scale would be a, a set, a collection of notes. You can have something like a major scale. And this is not, um, technically a scale because I, I gave the notes names right away. Um, it's actually a chromatic key in C, but we'll, we'll get to that. Do you have the major scale? Which in C would just be C, D, E, F. G, A, B, right? You could have the harmonic minor scale, which is this one. Right? The most common minor scale. So that's C, D, E flat, F, G, A flat, B flat, right? So these are examples of scales. There are essentially an infinite number of scales, right? There's also something like the pentatonic scale, which would be something like C, D, F, G, A, right? That's also sometimes used in certain musical styles. And so on, there's blue scale, there's uh, all sorts of different scales, right? So there are theoretically an infinite number of scales. And a scale is really just how many steps in between each note, 
um, it, uh, yeah, how many steps there are in between each note. So for a major scale, let me pick a color here. You would have a whole step, right? Another whole step, then a, let me pick a better color. This one. Half step. I just lost my color. Where's my color picker? Hello? Oh, it's over there. Sorry. I need to make the window slightly smaller so that it fits on my screen. There we go. And then whole step, whole step, whole step. And then the final one would be another half step, right? So this, these steps, are actually how you define a scale, right? Um, we usually write down scales as notes, but that's not really the correct way to do it, right? The correct way to do it would be to write down the steps, the space in between each note of a scale, because that allows you to just put a scale into anywhere else, right? If I take the major scale right now, I have C, okay. But if I take this pattern, whole, whole, half, whole, 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 half, and transpose it to something like, I don't know, G, and start with G, I get another major scale with the exact same pattern just starting on a different note, right? So that's what a scale is. And you define scales based on the steps. And there are, of course, different than just whole and half. You can have uh, one and a half steps. You can even have two steps and so on, right? Uh, for instance, here there is one, two, three, right? So that's one and a half steps here. You have a, a whole step here, and then you have a whole and half step here, right? And then another whole step here, whole step here, and then another a whole and half here for the pentatonic scale, right? So the types of steps you have, you can have are also anything you want, right? That That is what allows us to have an infinite number of scales. Now the keys are tightly related to scales. Keys are essentially a scale with a certain starting note, bass note, or the um, tonic. It's called the tonic, right? So tonic, in this case, is the, the root note. And a, a key is a scale plus a specific tonic. <laughs> scales can have, fish can have as many scales as they want. Got to dream big, right? So all of these up here are actually chromatic key of C, the major key of C, the harmonic minor key of C, the pentatonic key of C, because I started these on C, right? If I have, say, a major key of G, right, which is just written as G, right, done, that, that looks, that's a bad G, like that, then you would have a scale of uh, G, A, B, C, D, E, I'm writing way off, but eh, F, right? So this would be the the scale to use, or the key to use, if you have a major scale of, a major key of G, right? And keys are really what make music. Um, a lot of songs, or most songs probably, are written with a single key in mind. And you can have other notes. You can have notes outside of this key in a song. You can have chords outside of this key in a song. But 
the song always resolves back to the key. Right? You could take the tonic, the root note of it, and just completely constantly play it through the song, and the song will keep returning to it. Right? And that's how you know you have a specific key. And that's how you also notice things like key changes. When a song changes the key, you have to change the root note in order to still fit. Right? So when a song, a lot of pop songs don't do this, right? They sing, they have the chorus at the end, and then suddenly they go up by however much, right? One step or even a fifth or whatever, and sing the same chorus, but suddenly the root note has changed, and that's a key change, right? So it resolves back to a completely different note. And that's how you can think about keys. A key, and, and the name itself is also uh, helpful in this regard. A key is the, the basic foundation of a song, the basic foundational note of a song, right? Whereas the scale is literally how you scale the tones, right? How, how far apart the rungs on a ladder are as you climb up right so that's keys and scales right? and you can get a lot of different ones like i said and you can transpose them you can shift them around as much as you want right we have 12 different notes and you can play any scale in any note right that is um that is the big change to music that Beethoven brought. Um, to to uh, yeah, he changed classical music again. That is history <laughs> to make it possible for us to have any scale in any key. Right. So I could have uh, the pentatonic scale in C. I could also have the pentatonic scale in C sharp. Yes, you may. <laughs> right? This is one or... Oops. Right? This is another um, pentatonic scale on F. <laughs> and such. So, that's... That's uh, what allows us to, to play around with music. And that's also things like if you want to sing a specific song, but the song is too high or too low for you, for your singing range, you can shift the entire song up or down. And the only thing that changes is how high or how low the song ends up being. The song itself all the internal changes, all the steps, all the notes, or the names of the notes, yeah, but all of that does not change, right? And that's, that's the, the feature of having scales, which show um, the steps in between the notes that are involved, and keys, which then show the root note. Uh, the home base of the song. Right, I've talked a lot. Um, and it's a bit weird asking this on stream, but uh, are there any questions? <laughs> I usually do this in class, but in class it's a bit more direct. So... I don't know. I'll, I'll just ask, I guess. Are there any, any questions or any things you, you don't understand or you want to know? What type of music do I listen to? Ooh, um, a lot. All sorts of music. Um, I listen to uh, classical music, I listen to jazz, I listen to 
soundtracks, metal, um, even dubstep. Uh, du yeah, dubstep as well. <laughs> I, I listen to that sometimes. So, like, pop music as well. Um, I I don't narrow myself down to, to genres. It's more the individual song. Like, if I like a song or a piece of music, then I listen to that. I also listen to a lot of uh, experimental music. Um, and so on. So, really just... just anything that that's that's a question i can't really answer because it's the answer is just anything but um i did grow up with jazz so um i i learned piano from a very young age like 5 or something and i've always been learning more or less learning jazz piano right my teacher all the way back then uh introduced me to to boogies and blues right which are related to jazz and then um in school in in middle school and high school i was part of the school jazz band and <laughs> i was more or less the only pianist in the entire school or the only student pianist in the entire school uh, who could handle jazz piano because I grew up in Taiwan and in Taiwan if you learn piano you learn classical right and a lot of parents sent their kids to to learn piano because it's very prestigious to do so <laughs> uh eighth and middle school well that's you know I it's all about how much you practice it like I haven't been practicing it consistently so eh, I, my playing is not very good um I'm I'm much more on the theory side than on the actual fingers on keyboard side, um, but yeah, that that was uh, a funny, not coincidence, but like a, a funny circumstance, right? Because all the other pianists in school, and and a lot of them were really amazing. Like a lot of the students, dang, they could really play good piano, but they all played classical, right? Because that's what they learned, because that's just what. Uh, the society there expects from prestigious pianists, right? You learn classical. And then I was the only one who learned jazz. <laughs> so, and there were a couple of other students who, who tried to, to play jazz piano, come to the jazz band and try things out, and then they were all like, what is this? What, what is syncopation? What is swing? What is improv? What, what are these chords? I don't understand. And then they left quickly after. So... <laughs> Um, I, I, I kind of had job security in that sense, <laughs> which, which was nice, you know, the one thing I could do in school. Um, so I latched onto that. And then from that, from jazz piano, from improv, started learning theory. So that's where I am now, right? Um, yeah, so music theory. Um, yeah, so that's scales and keys. Like I said, scales are the steps, and keys are a scale plus a very specific root note, a tonic. And all of these things, also all of the, the steps and such, also have names. Like um, a, a half step, a, uh, or a minor second, a major second, a minor third, major third, perfect fourth, and so on and so forth. You don't need to know those. Um, it can be interesting, but you don't really need to know those starting out. You just need to know how to name individual notes. You need to know, okay, what is a whole step? What is a half step? Maybe what is a one and a half step or whole half? Right. And, and that's it. You need to know how to combine these. Um, if you want to start working with music. Alright, let's see. Add another layer. Hide this one. Okay. So, on to one of my favorite parts of music theory. Which is the circle of fifths. So, the circle of fifths... So again, who, who has heard of the circle of fifths before, or who has even, like, 
learned it before, maybe, so that I know how much I should go into or, or how much I need to explain. Um, so yeah, the circle of fifths. What is the circle of fifths? The circle of fifths is a way to arrange keys in a circular fashion. And what that gives you is it gives you a very good way to transition from one key to another or to include certain keys or include certain scales in this case into a song with a specific key. I'll, I'll show you what I mean. So we start out with C and this is all in major, right? So this is, there are again, multiple different um, circle of fifths possible, right? This is the circle of fifths in majors. So we start with C major and C major is all of the white keys, right? We had this and then what we do is we look at a fifth we go a fifth in one direction so a fifth is just the fifth note of the key so one two three four five which is the G All right and this is now the G major scale Ah, it's not easy clicking on these. There we go. <laughs> Sorry for misclicks. So one step on the circle of fifths is the G. We can keep going, right? One step from G. So the fifth of G is D. So we get the D major scale, right? Um... And this keeps going. You get A, we get E, we get B, and then we go into Oops. There, right? That's the B major scale. And the fifth note here. Is an F sharp. Right? So down here, we actually then start getting an F sharp and so on and so forth. Um, F sharp, we can continue, right? The fifth of an F sharp is the C sharp. And then the fifth of a C sharp. And then we actually just continue down here is the G sharp and then the D sharp and then a sharp, E sharp, and then the E, the fifth of an E sharp would be a B sharp, but a B sharp is just the C again. So we return to the C, right? So this is the circle of fifths in one direction, right? We can also go the other direction. We can also go down, right? And then we can go down a fifth. Which in this case, five notes, right, is the F. And lo and behold, F and E sharp are the same note. F, right, and E sharp, half a step up, is again the F. So this circle works in both directions, right? We can then keep going. This is... <laughs> there is no test yet. It's, it's still coming, right? So we have the B flat here. We have an E flat here. We have an A flat here. C sharp is the D flat here. F sharp is the G flat here. And we can technically keep going. C flat, right? F flat, 
Uh, this is a B double flat, right? Like I said, notes can have <laughs> notes can have multiple names. This would be an E double flat, and so on and so forth, right? It's no point writing down everything because it gets too cluttered. But I think you get the picture, right? We can keep going and going and going around the circle and just keep adding sharps or flats and so on. Um, and the notes will always stay, right? So this is the circle of fifths in its most basic form. So you see... <laughs> uh, what, this one? <laughs> That is a flat. I, I, I'm afraid I might not get it. Um, like so, right? Um, and so you have the circle of fifths in this manner. Let me write it down. Oh, <laughs> what type of flat is it? Is that a music joke? That I'm just too obtuse to get right now, or oh, <laughs> okay, and then sorry, I'm I'm just eh, too far in, I guess, too far gone. Um. Oh yeah, usually you just end here with B flat, C flat, A flat, oh, A flat. Right. Uh. What do you get when you drop a piano on a kid? A flat minor. Anyway. Let's uh let's continue. So typically this is where you stop, right? Because anything else just clutters up um the circle. <laughs> Good job. Right. So this is the circle of fifths. How is this useful? Like I said, this is useful if you want to shift in degrees that sound nice. Right? So... And it is also to, to uh, see immediately what, uh, what key you're in just from the amounts of sharps and flats. So what we do when we have a specific key, right? And this is now musical notation. Actually, is there a line tool? That would be much better. There we go, line tool. Yes. Okay. So when we have a piece of music that's in a certain key, um, say a, a G major, Right, a G major key, which has, or let's get one with more, um, D major, for instance. So D major has the F sharp, oops, the G, this, and then the C sharp as well, right? So it has the F sharp and the C sharp. So when we write music that's in D major, Right, we can put um, these sharps in front of every note that has them in the melody, right? But that gets tedious very quickly, as you can see. Right? That's a lot of clutter. So what we actually do is we put all of the sharps that are constant, that are determined by the key, we put those at the very beginning of the notation. So, right, have this, and then we would just put the F 
uh so yeah the f sharp here and then the c sharp here right and this tells us this this is by the way in the in the oh that is ugly is this the wrong way did i forget how to there we go okay major uh or like treble clef um so this is this tells us this is in the key of d major or it it tells us it's likely in the key of d major like i said names are very flexible in music and depend on context right um because we know we have an f sharp this is the f sharp and this is the c sharp and we know this is used in d major because we can see this from circle of fifths so in the circle of fifths when we go from c which has no sharps and no flats if we take this and go to g we add the oops the f sharp right into there then when we go from g to d we keep the f sharp and add the c sharp and here from d to a we keep all the previous ones and add the g sharp and so on and so forth right so we keep all of the previous ones and then add a new one to this and from the amount of sharps in front you can tell um what key we're likely in so c has zero sharps in the front g has a single one and it's the f d has two it's the f and the c a has three which is f c and g right e has four f c g d and so on and the same thing happens in reverse except now we're adding flats because we're going down right so if we have f major that's the b flat So we add the B flat to the F major scale. And then when we go down to a B flat, we keep the B flat and we add the E flat. Right? And so on and so forth. When we go to E flat, we keep these two and we add the A flat and so on. Uh, we go here, we add the D flat. We go here, we add the G flat. And here we add the, uh, well, what is it? I forgot. C flat, I think, which is a B. Which, again, so yeah, you would have a C flat in there. Um, yeah, exactly. Uh, learning the minor key. And, and the beautiful thing is, minor keys and such um, are something called modes that's that's another topic i want to cover in another session there is this thing called modes and a lot of the common scales and keys translate into modes and once you know how to deal with modes finding all of these common scales becomes even simpler right so that's that's the beauty of it instead of having to memorize weird things you can instead look at patterns and recreate a lot of the things you work with using the patterns. The circle of fifths is such a pattern, right? Like I said, all we're doing is going up in fifths, right? That's all we're doing here. And this gives us this pattern of arranging things and giving us sharps and flats as we need so this is two sharps so that means this is very likely d major right i'll write it like this for now which is not quite correct but eh and if we have another one let me just do this quickly with say three flats in there so we have a b flat in there we have an e flat in there and then an a flat in there that's three flats and we know this is most likely in the key of E flat major, right? Because one, two, three gives us E flat major. 
right? So this is one big help. You can just count these, the number of them. You don't even have to know which ones they are. Again, this gives you which ones they are because there are patterns in here, right? This is just always the seventh sharp, and this is the, uh, the fifth, right? Oops. Flat. Is it the fifth? No, sorry, the fourth. Can't count. Fourth. Right? And this is a pattern that repeats. It stays. So you take the fourth. Right? This would be the fourth and you drop it to the sh flat. And that gives you which flat you have. Or here, this is the fifth, so uh is it no it's the seventh, sorry. Uh where am I here? Six seven and you sharp that and then you get this. So again, this is a pattern. Right? And this holds all the way around. The reason it's four and seven is because you can see four and seven are the ones involved with the no black keys, right? There's no black keys here, which is why it's four and seven. Uh, that makes sense, <laughs> right? So, yeah, that's that's it. So this is a very useful tool if you're looking at music or if you're... And it, it has more uses beyond this, right? But if you're looking at music and you're seeing, oh, there's two sharps in here. Okay, this is G major. Uh, D major, sorry, because two sharps. Or if you have... Five sharps, one, two, three, four, five. Ah, it's a B major, right? Um, or it has, I don't know, four flats. One, two, three, four. Ah, it's an A minor, uh, a, a flat major, right? So this is a tool to use for, for finding keys of music. There are more uses, right? Way more uses for this, uh, including adding more stuff more color to pieces of music like you have a piece of music in the key of g major how do you add chord progressions how do you add interesting new chords or scales that can fit into the music um, without disrupting it too much while you look at the circle of his and look what is adjacent right you're probably not gonna add something that's a d flat uh key into a song that's in G major. But adding something that's on C or on D can fit very well because a lot of these notes correspond to each other, right? They overlap. These keys overlap. And that tells you, oh, okay, I can probably use this in my music and it'll add a bit of color, but it won't completely disrupt the music overall. And there are many more uses <laughs> for the circle of fist, but that's too many to go into here right now. And some of the uses require more knowledge of theory to, to understand what's actually going on here. Um, but yeah, that's a very quick and dirty introduction to the circle of fifths. One of the most powerful, in my opinion, one of the most powerful tools in Western music theory. Um, and we will see more of that as we continue with other topics in music theory. So, uh, look at the time. Okay, yeah. I would say we actually got a lot done today. Um, so we looked at uh, how names of things can differ, right? But they all refer to the same thing. It's kind of like maths, right? Do the same thing. Kind of like in maths, if you have one half is equal to 0 0.5, these are the same number, right? We just use different names for them. Um, we looked at scales, which is steps between notes and we looked at 
keys, which is a scale plus a tonic and a root note. And we had a first look at the circle of fifths. Actually, quite a lot. <laughs> so if you stuck with this the whole time, uh, I congratulate you. This was probably a lot at once and not a lot of musical examples yet because it's a bit difficult for me to to create music on the computer like this. I don't have a MIDI keyboard or anything where I can just play stuff. I would have to click on this and so on. Um, but yeah, kudos to you if you stuck throughout all of this. If you do have any questions, feel free to ask. But I am here. Um, you can ask now. Or you can even, uh, like, feel free to uh, use Twitter or so to ask <laughs> if you want. Um, I'm I'm always willing to explain things. <laughs> well, then then absorb this slowly. Um, these are some basics that we will come back to again and again throughout uh, this uh, this topic of music theory. So it'll just keep getting reinforced. Right? And these are basics that are always useful. Right? So these couple of basics, the names of things, scales and keys, are some things you will always use in music. Right? So Yeah. Um on that note, uh -huh. <laughs> I I thank everyone. For coming here this was a lot of fun i hope it was a lot of fun for you as well and very educational as well right um and yeah let's see <laughs> yes indeed okay let's go over here for now right close these things real quick so that they don't uh Okay, close all of these programs real quick. Right, clear up. Mm hmm Okay, so, yeah, now with this done, um, I will continue music theory next week um, with... I'm, I'm kind of open to what uh, what exactly I will talk about depends on what people are interested in um but i might go a deeper dive into scales and keys um there is no homework homework is ineffective <laughs> actual fact homework is ineffective or assigned homework is ineffective if you want to look up some some videos on youtube there are a lot of fascinating videos <laughs> on on youtube um there's uh harmony videos there's like intros to music theory um that explain things differently <laughs> don't don't like run into other people please be careful <laughs> and so on so yeah there's there's a lot of fascinating stuff actually a lot of videos um some of them explain it well some of them explain it eh. um but yeah there's there's a lot to see all right, as is Twitch tradition, we will look for someone to raid. Is there anyone? Uh, yes. How far along is this stream? Is it about to end? <laughs> I'm glad you enjoyed it. Oh, it's 30 minutes in. All right, awesome. We are going to raid into this channel then. So yeah, I, I thank everyone for coming here. I hope you enjoyed your time and I hope you learned a bit of something. Oh, that's amazing. I'm, I'm very glad to hear that. Uh, if, it, if it actually has uh, some practical help, that's, that's really nice. Um, yeah, so thanks. I will stream Talk Tuesday again next week.
at the same time and we'll continue with music theory go more into keys and scales right uh different types of them what they mean what they do and i'm likely going to stream music theory rate okay yeah <laughs> you, you find the best rate messages joe that's dang i need to like hire you for this or something rate rate message texter um <laughs> and uh yeah i'm i will try to stream some more on other days this week um i have a couple of games i need to go to go through i haven't touched in a while i might do an art stream where i work on some more assets for the stream um but yeah i i will see i i will definitely try to stream more this week um now that my sleeping has calmed down a bit so yeah we'll see <laughs> i haven't hired you yet <laughs> we'll see but yeah we are going to raid let me type this uh let me get the name right resident lemon j we are going to raid j who is also a very comfy streamer um she's doing art right now right and um just started does some very nice art so yeah go say hi for me and uh i will hope to see you again soon bye bye and take care <laughs>